Hello everyone. I'm Dr. Dalia Ghanem, resident scholar at the Carnegie Middle East Center. I am here uh, and honored to be here because I am moderating this amazing panel talking and discussing uh, women uh, during the Arab Spring. And I am here with four amazing women uh, who are going to discuss and debate this, um, the role of women during the Arab Spring. Uh, so uh, with me is Intisar, Khariji uh, from Tunisia, uh, Diana Mallad from uh, Lebanon, Yasmin Al-Nadiri from Yemen, and Maya Al-Ammar, who is, uh, I'm not sure Maya, is she Lebanese or not, but uh, everyone will be introduced uh, properly. And uh, I'm starting um, now with the main discussion. So throughout the Arab world, from Tunisia to Yemen, passing by Iraq, Lebanon, women have been key players in the Arab Spring, be it in the first wave in 2011 that started in Tunisia, followed by Egypt, Libya, Bahrain, and more, uh, to the second wave in 2019 that arrived in Algeria or started in Algeria, in uh, Yemen, in Sudan, in Iraq, and in Lebanon. In all MENA capitals, women protested, took up to the street with witty and intelligent slogans, organized marches and local committees to debate, entered in hunger strikes sometimes, opened blogs, screamed, chanted, wrote, and stood next to their male counterparts even in jails, and some even lost their lives. Some became icons such as Lina bin Mahenni in Tunisia, Tawakkul Karvan in Yemen, or Mahyin Noor Al Masri in Egypt. Others, the majority, millions, we do not know their names, but they have been there in the street of the MENA countries. They are mothers, they are soldiers, protesters, journalists, doctors, feminists, volunteers, and more. But above all, they are citizen women who are claiming or reclaiming their citizenship and the right to be full-fledged citizens. Today, we are here to discuss the outcomes of these fights that took up and shook up the region, to which extent women's right and gender equality improved. Moreover, today, as rewards are reaching a stalemate, how far is this road to greater equality with their menfolk? Women sustain their male counterparts, but to what extent are they sustaining them? Women have sustained the Arab Spring, but it remains to be seen if the Arab Spring will sustain them. So today, we're going to start the discussion with Maya Al-Ammar. Maya Al-Ammar is a feminist writer, activist, and communication professional who had led nationwide feminist media campaigns on issues related to family, violence, child, marriage, personal status law, and the kafala system, among other topics. Maya is currently uh, contributing to various media outlets as a journalist, writer, and translator alongside her job as a media strategist for a non-profit organization. Maya also has experience leading training sessions for civil society groups in the fields of gender and communication. She has a BA in journalism and an MA in communication studies. After Maya will introduce us and give us this general view about the role of women within uh, the Arab Spring in the MENA region, we will move to one of the first country, not to say the first country that started this revolution, my dear neighborhood, my dear neighbor, Tunisia. Uh, and we will have Intisar Khariji to talk about it. Intisar is a PhD candidate in a political science, uh, in political science, sorry, at the Center for International Relations at Sciences Po Université de Paris and researcher at Jasmine Foundation. Intisar, in 2013, she co-founded Jasmine Foundation, a think and do tank in Tunisia that focuses on youth and women empowerment in relation to citizen participation in decision making and social accountability. The NGO works to design and facilitate participatory planning process at the local level, bringing citizens and local authorities together to develop innovation 
innovative solutions to public challenges, thus contributing to building a democratic culture in Tunisia. Uh, uh, sorry, am I on? Did I did I do a mistake? Yeah, okay. Um, so, Intisar academic research focuses on local governance and decentralization, youth and women. And Intisar will uh, lead us, will explain to us how all started in Tunisia. What was the role of women? How the Tunisian neighbor started one of the most brilliant revolution that will shake the Arab Spring, that will shake the Arab region. Then we will move in another part of the MENA region with Yasmin Nadiri, with Yemen. Uh, Yasmin uh, is a Yemeni political activist and an expert in peace and security policies. She's the executive director of the Peace Truck Initiative and the founding member of the Women's Solidarity Network. Yasmin is working to create a space for women's participation in the peace building process. She led the Peace Truck Initiative, Women's Civil Society Delegation, who participated on the sidelines of Geneva Peace Consultation for Yemen in September. 2018. And the last and not the least, uh, my dear friend Diana Mellad, who will uh, talk about uh, Lebanon. Uh, I want to say a, a special uh, thank. Uh, thank you to her. Um, it's always great to have you, Diana. And uh, why I'm saying that? Uh, because I am biased. I have been living in Lebanon for the 10 uh, last years, and this is my country of adoption in a way. Diana is a Lebanese journalist and documentary producer, director with 28 years of experience in covering hot zones and writing and producing stories in the Middle East. Uh, her war coverage included Lebanon, Afghanistan in 2001, Iraq in 2003, and Yemen in 2015. In 2017, Diana, along with two other founders, have launched Daraj Daraj.com, an independent media platform addressing controversial issues that are underreported in the Arab region. Daraj was the only Arab media platform to be part of Paradise Papers by ICIG. Diana is also a columnist and a media and gender trainer. So without uh, taking too much of your time, we are going to start with uh, Maya, who will give us a general view of what's going on, what happened, what are women, uh, what are women fights, how did they lead them, what are their achievements, and what are their hopes. Maya, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dalia, for this wonderful introduction and really an honor to be with these brilliant women uh, around me today. And I've got a lot to learn from you as well. So um, um, I guess when, uh, when we are asked as women and as feminists this question of hope and achievement, uh, it's a, it's very difficult to to answer really. I I cannot but start with the list of grievances that we have, the list of traumas that we have, the list of um, missed opportunities that we have, uh, post revolutionary moments and specifically post 2011 in Tunisia and then in Egypt. Um, but I promise to end with a brighter note. Uh, in terms of grievances, I think we have to deal with the fact that as feminists, we were very shocked and even traumatized to see that the gains that we've made uh, throughout the past decades were this fragile, this uh, threatened, easily threatened. Um, we found ourselves stuck in a gulf, in a rift between between Islamists who formed huge parts of opposition movements and repressive regimes on the other hand. So on the one hand, right after the revolutionary uprising moment, we've seen how, uh, how our um, rights to be in the public space, how our rights also to be protected, uh, to be equal uh, in the eyes of the law and society, um, we're extremely fragile. So the first thing that they do is 
uh, after instrumentalizing women um, in the public sphere, probably for statistics reasons or for political ideological reasons, the first thing that these political groups, the fundamentalists would do is basically to control them again uh, in the private sphere. Uh, so these uh, these sort of gains were were extremely threatened by the revival of old attitudes in in many post revolutionary moments in the region, and I think it's okay to say that we were sort of uh, disappointed at, at, in many instances as uh, as women, and and then we we had to rediscuss very basic issues like child marriage again, our rights to wear or not to wear a hijab, um, uh, anything related to education even, to freedom of movement. So these issues that have been taken for granted for years in, in many uh, settings, maybe for the wrong reasons, but but they they were there as rights. We had to rediscuss them and, and re-question them. And then we still rose, I mean, against all of these systems in, in 2013, 2014, uh, in Algeria in 2019. But you find yourselves instrumentalized yet again and another time, but this, but but this time by 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 the military, by repressive regimes who oppress their people and basically forbid them to express any opinion and 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 lead any political life or have any say um, in the daily questions and matters that that rule their lives. So we're sort of stuck in this rift somehow. Uh, but I think that the way we've evolved is we 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 broke this duality. We the youth, I guess, and and the young generations uh, we've seen in Lebanon and Iraq sort of gave hope to the feminist movement again that we do not want to be stuck in this rift. And I suppose that um, the, the the young generation is now leading all the changes that we've always dreamed of in a in a brilliant way and in a very daring way. Like before, uh, like a couple of years earlier, uh, we've we've seen how women were easily pushed from from the forefront to merely being like some footnotes uh, at the end of the day uh, at home. Uh, we were we were protesting in the streets with our joyful bodies, but then our bodies became the weapon, became the battlefield uh, between the fundamentalists and repressive regimes. But then a third, fourth, fifth voice or group um, penetrated this whole equation and actually uh, flipped it all over. And and I think we've we've seen the the amount of resistance. Uh, that's been there all along, and that that couldn't be buried at at, at any point throughout the, this last decade. So, for example, um, the oppression, the sexual violence, the sexual assaults, the the circles of hell that we've seen in many protest settings. I think, in one way or another, they paved the way towards, in Western terminology, it's probably called the fourth wave. So, but but in our ter terminology, it's simply our awareness of our bodily uh, rights, and 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 I think that, in one way or another, the oppression itself uh, led us to actually claim it. Uh, I'm sure they they they, they didn't see this coming. Uh, they didn't plan it this way, but this is what happened at the end of the day. You started seeing young people um, just not, not not afraid of anything anymore, despite all the risks. I'm not saying like everyone should be brave and courageous. There's there's a, there's a tons of things to be scared of, but I don't think that we've witnessed such a moment in the past decade or two or three. Uh, it was probably the 70s in France, but we never really witnessed it here until a few years ago. I think that um, the feminists now are leading battles at, 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 at multiple fronts and mostly at the body front where they're actually saying it's not the sexual harassment that defined us or that brought awareness to our issues. It's our resistance to it that brought awareness to, to, to our issues. And it's not us uh, who should be ashamed of what's, what's happening. It's actually you. And in Tunisia, in Algeria, in Lebanon, in Iraq, in Egypt, 
uh, and elsewhere, um, I think women have become um, much vo much more vocal about about these uh, bodily rights and rights to protection and and to autonomy. Maybe to varying degrees. I'm not saying it's the same everywhere, but you what but we've seen it as a as a as a movement spreading across the region bit by bit, and obviously because of the whole technologies we now own in in our hands, and that's helping us uh, raise our voice and amplify our. Uh, our issues and complaints and just break this whole prioritization politics that always leaves our issues behind and tells us that first we liberate the nation and second uh, you can um, subsequently enjoy your rights and we know throughout history that this is not true this has never been true even women who have been organizing with secular movements um, across these countries with, with leftist so-called pro progressive groups, they've found a really hard time to voice out their concerns and, and their demands because they've always been silenced uh, or mansplained, etc. Uh, but the, the, those revolutionary moments, I mean, this, despite all of these grievances, they allowed these um, concerns to surface and they allowed for uh, feminist consciousness across the region to be formed. They allowed for more networks to come together. Uh, and, and I suppose it's, it's this oppression itself that, uh, that has led to, um, to, to, to discourses that are this much outright and that sort of scare uh, the statu quo and the system and, and the guardians of the, of the system. And I think what we're basically saying here as feminists is like, we don't want the Muslim Brotherhood, the Islamists, the fundamentalists controlling our bodies. We don't want the military boots and the repressive regimes controlling our bodies. And getting out of this uh, dichotomy, I think, is, is, the, is, the, is the heroic thing that feminists are doing and inspiring basically the whole, uh, the whole political movement. I'll just end with a note that, that I always observe, that my colleagues always observe, feminists observe everywhere. It's, it's always the, the personal status codes. Um, if you look at Algeria from the night from 1984, there's this code, and then 20, 2005, there's been probably a few changes, and it's still their demand to actually remove that law, which still has a lot of areas of discrimination against women. Uh, in uh, in Egypt, in Egypt, it's the same. Uh, th there's always improvements, khula, um, right to travel, etc., but never really an egalitarian uh, just law. In Lebanon, it's the same, and it's been forever uh, since the feminists are demanding a, a, an overthrow to this. So I think the key issue that ties th that ties us together now is really this bodily rights, sexual violence um, awareness, and and the a private sphere where the family affairs are 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 basically ruled by, uh, if not by religion, inspired by uh, by religion. So I think this is what's binding us together across the region. I mean, despite the differences in context, you'd be appalled when when you see the similarities and the the scope of the similarities we we have between us. And I think there's. There's really a very long, uh, long way to go. And we always, I know Intisar is going to speak, we always bring up Tunisia as an example in the region. And we've seen how the first thing, one of the first things that were discussed uh, after 2011, 2012 was actually bringing it back again, the complementarity between men and women in the constitution. And we were so impressed and inspired by how much the feminist movement was able to actually counter this. And, and counter all uh, sorts, all types of fundamentalism and, and backwardness. Uh, definitely Tunisia is a different example with all like the union organizing that they have and, and the feminist movements that, uh, that they have. Uh, it, I guess it was very much clear to us that there is a system that's established that, was, that had the tools to, um, to fight back which unfortunately we still don't because of the whole political mess we live in. But um, yes, Antisar, I think uh, we, we all look forward to what's going on in Tunisia. Yes. And, um, yes. and I'll leave that up to you to describe. So yes, so that's basically my overview of, of like the past 10 years in like 10 minutes.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. That was brilliant. And you offered me the perfect transition to Intisar. Intisar, can you tell us more about how has women political participation changed th since the uprising? Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Dalia. Um, so yes, I, what Maya was saying uh, rings a lot of bells, I think, in, the, in, in different uh, countries across the region. Um, and what we found uh, really in Tunisia is that, um, you know, there was a large a scale of participation by women in the beginning of the revolution. Uh, women were very visible uh, in the front lines, fighting alongside men for, you know, political rights, economic rights, making the same demands for, you know, freedom, dignity, for social justice, but also making their own demands, you know, specific demands for equal rights as women. Uh, so in the Tunisian context, um, there are some particularities, as Maya was mentioning, uh, about the Tunisian context, because you had uh, a tradition of state feminism, state-led feminism practiced uh, by the Tunisian state, uh, where women did have uh, extended legal rights compared to other countries in the region, uh, where they had reproductive rights. Um, and we also had a very strong women's movement that has been uh, stretches back to the 1920s and 1930s, uh, with women participating in uh, the independence struggle. Um, but for a lot of women, actually, in reality, for a lot of Tunisian women, a lot of this was really a discourse. It was a decor uh, of, of women's uh, rights that didn't actually translate into real rights um, in, in, uh, in daily, li daily life. Uh, and so a lot of women, especially those who are on the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum, uh, didn't uh, enjoy these rights. They were marginalized, they were paid less, they discriminated against. Politically also women, you know, were present in the parliament, but they didn't really enjoy any decision-making power. And so in 2011, you had uh, a real um, awakening, in fact, and a sort of um, um, politicization of uh, a new generation of, of younger women, especially. Uh, who uh, didn't have any civic or political activism before, but the new space of um, freedom of expression really enabled them to come forward and to raise new issues that um, you know, have been taboo, have been ignored and overlooked uh, in the past. Um, and I think something that has really helped in the Tunisian context is that uh, women really pushed for uh, formal participation as well from the very beginning. Uh, so we had uh, right at the beginning of the transition in 2011, uh, women's groups pushed for a gender quota for the first elections, uh, in which were held in 2011. Uh, so they pushed to have a quota of 50-50 uh, on all electoral lists, uh, which is called the, the zipper system. Uh, so thanks to this mobilization, uh, you know, they pressured the, the political parties and the trade unions and, and the associations that were involved in the uh, transitional body uh, to make sure that women would be equally represented on electoral lists. And this meant that women uh, represented 28% of the first assembly, which drafted the constitution. And um, this was very important because one, it made sure that women's priorities were present in the parliament. Uh, so women uh, you know, headed uh, many of the committees, the constitution drafting committees. Uh, they made sure that there were uh, provisions in the constitution that protect women's rights uh, and actually try to push them further. So they, uh, the constitution actually commits the Tunisian state to guarantee these rights in practice and to, to develop them further and also to protect women against violence, which is something that actually we didn't have a law that protected women against violence and made it possible for them to report violence and to, to, um, to uh, gain their uh, protection. And so this was really important because um, this really meant that these issues were raised in the constitutional setting. Um, and uh, at the same time, also having a quota introduced meant that uh, there was a certain um, you know, standard that was set, which could not be removed afterwards in subsequent elections. So actually what we saw is that the quota system that was introduced in 2011 was actually strengthened and expanded in 2014 and in 2018, so that uh, now we have not just you know 50-50 men and women, but also that 50% of lists, um, electoral lists, have to be headed by women as well. Uh, and so you know uh, a political party cannot just put all of the electoral lists headed by men; they have to make sure that half of them are headed by women. Uh, and so this is why 
you know, why am I uh, emphasizing this? Because really political participation has been very important, formal political participation, because it meant that women's priorities have been present uh, in the parliament, in the political process. Uh, and also, obviously, this has to be backed up by, you know, constant pressure by the women's organizations and by the feminist movement, uh, because otherwise the women in parliament, you know, don't have actually the support often within their parties to be able to push uh, a feminist or women's agenda. Uh, and so the, the two together, the formal political participation and also the mobilization by women's organizations are incredibly important. And that's what's led to uh, you know, the, the adoption of the Violence Against Women uh, law in 2017, uh, which, which changed a lot of um, archaic laws, um, you know, such as uh, you know, having this provision of um, uh, marrying one's rapist, for example. Uh, it allows, it recognizes all forms of violence against women, including on the, in the online sphere. Um, and so these things are significant advances uh, for Tunisian women. Um, and also, I think something that I work on it is uh, local politics and women's involvement in the local level. And this is incredibly important because uh, research shows in different countries that having more women in local government encourages more women into politics, firstly. Uh, it gives them governance experience so that they can uh, take up decision making uh, roles at higher level and also it leads to decisions and budgets and services that are more responsive to the needs and priorities of women and so in the areas we work in you know we work with uh, women to involve them in, in decision making at the local level in deciding how their local budgets should be spent and this is all part of, of um, civic consciousness and of uh, becoming uh, active citizens and engage citizens so that they can take part in actually setting the priorities of their country. Um, at the same time, I, I, you know, I don't want to paint a, a completely rosy picture. Um, you know, at the end of the day, there are a lot of challenges that are remaining. Uh, we saw, for example, uh, the, the Tunisia's Me Too movement, Enezeda, uh, which, uh, which uh, erupted uh, a year or two ago. And uh, this really brought to the fore the, the extent of sexual harassment that women face in the public sphere and violence in the, in the, in the private sphere as well. Um, so, you know, according to surveys, around a third of Tunisian women have, have experienced physical violence in the public or private sphere. And so there are serious problems continuing and women's organizations have to continue struggling to actually try to put uh, women's uh, rights as a priority within the transition. Uh, and this is particularly challenging when you have uh, so many different challenges uh, at the national level uh, that uh, women's priorities are often set aside. And so it's a constant, uh, constant effort or, and struggle by women's organizations. Um, and I think also, um, you know, we have to also think about which women are counted as well. And I think one thing that has emerged uh, since the revolution is that there are many overlooked groups of women who are often not uh, engaged in the women's movement and who are not addressed um, by a lot of women's activism. So one group in particular who have emerged as uh, you know being more visible now are rural women, uh, rural women who face a lot more actually violations of their rights. Uh, who are working in very uh, shocking conditions, who are getting paid much less than, uh, than their counterparts, their male counterparts. And so something positive is actually trying to also expand our definition of who counts actually when we are talking about women's rights and trying to really expand these rights, their actual enjoyment, uh, you know, to a broader swathe of women. Uh, and so I think the, you know, the situation we have in Tunisia, freedom of expression, uh, has created a space for uh, women to come forward to raise taboo subjects that couldn't be raised before. Um, and also it's created greater political consciousness uh, among uh, a swathe of women who were never involved before in activism. Um, so it's really taken women's activism beyond a small core um, of, of veteran activists um, and really uh, engaged a lot, um, a lot more younger women as well into the struggle. Thank you, Intisar. That was brilliant. I couldn't agree more with you, you know, but, but I, I, you know, you're right when you say there is this 
uh, growing political consciousness. I remember when I was in the street of Algiers and I went to, to what is called Le Carré Féministe, the feminist uh, quarter. I, uh, I, I talked with a very young female and uh, I was uh, really impressed by their uh, political uh, maturity. Uh, they said, uh, we will not do the mistakes of our grandmothers and mothers. And when I said, what do you mean? They said they participated into the fight in the fight of independence of Algeria between 1954 and 1962. And when the independence was uh, here, they told them go back to the kitchen because there are more important matters. And so they agreed. And this time in 2019, we do not agree with that. And we are going to fight and to talk about these issues now, because if we do not do it now, we will never do it. And I think another problem where another country where there is a problem of women accessing to the 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 the, the policy the policy uh, the political arena and participating in in uh, in peace and process in peace process and government is Yemen. Um, and uh, I think Yasemin is going to talk about it. But uh, Yasemin, in a few uh, words, uh, uh, ten years since the Yemeni revolution, where do you think that the Yemeni women today are standing? Uh, or in another word, how does women participate, participation look like uh, in Yemen and whether they are as excluded, as much excluded as they were before? I mean, uh, do they participate in peace talk and the decision making process? Please, uh, would you tell us more about it? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very thrilled actually to be today among these distinguished uh, women. Um, ten years since the Yemeni uh, revolution of dignity, where are the Yemeni women now? Um, Yemeni women today are either in prisons in Houthi controlled areas or in, uh, um, in camps as IDPs in what is so-called uh, liberated areas. Uh, they are local mediators, they are political activists, they are uh, human rights defenders. They're everywhere apart uh, from being in a decision-making position. Uh, to make it clear, they are uh, in front lines serving their communities, uh, uh, trying to uh, lead peace initiatives and lead civil society organizations and dispute conflicts. Um, also release detainees, uh, negotiating opening the humanitarian corridors, yet they don't have a, a seat at the negotiation table. Um, just to walk you through uh, the women participation nowadays in Yemen. Um, uh, first, in the political process, uh, they are excluded from the new formed government, uh, the legitimate government, uh, which was formed uh, four months ago. Uh, in accordance to the Riyadh Agreement, which was signed in November 2019. In the peace process, uh, as you know, uh, it consists of three diplomacy tracks. Uh, track one, we have only one woman in the uh, delegation of the government uh, and no woman at all in uh, the uh, Houthi uh, uh, delegation. And of course, at the end of the day, it's a militia and we don't uh, expect much from them in terms of women presentation. But uh, we expected, we would expect from the government to lead by example a very, uh, uh, let's say, uh, to lead by example implementing the NDC or the National Dialogue uh, outcome, uh, outcomes which uh, guarantee for the women the uh, at least 30% uh, quota uh, uh, participating in the government. Um, Yes, and uh, and in track one as well, uh, the UN Special Envoy uh, has came up with a new uh, a form of uh, participation, which uh, also showed um, unmeaningful participation. It's uh, the Women uh, the Technical Advisory Group. It's a it's a it's a secondary role for women to be part in the negotiation uh, process. Yet the role is not very clear, and it was given as a compensation for the absence of women from the negotiation table. Um, uh, so um, in track two, in the track two, a men-led organization are being uh, contracted and funded to work on a uh, women's issue or in gender issue, which means uh, reinforcing the men's perspective in a very patriarchal uh, system or society. Um, uh, in track three, which is the grass on the grassroots uh, level, 
um, women uh, are facing difficulties um, accessing fund because the criteria set by the donors are very complicated and um, it requires at least uh, they don't work with young organizations so this is another uh, obstacle created by the donors um, yeah so so I, I try to preview on the on the uh, current situation I mean even though Yemeni women have led uh, I wouldn't say that they were partner with men, but they have led the uh, the uh, um, revolution in Yemen. And, and despite being in a very conservative society, uh, men were very proud to 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 be behind them, to stand behind them, and to uh, to lead by the, to be led by them. And women at that time were source of 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 uh, uh, proud to all the Yemenis. Um, Yes, we are going through war, but we have lots of concerns. And I think uh, Maya and Intisar have talked uh, enough about uh, political participation. Um, the list is so long to, to speak about um, the challenges we are facing. Uh, but um, what started in 2006 from the women who held many demonstration uh, to, uh, um, towards and march towards the presidential palace, uh, to demand quota for women will continue as it uh, continued in, in the national dialogue. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I think, yeah, many of these men, you know, they are very proud uh, whenever we are within the revolution demonstrating, but when everything is over, they are also very happy to say, okay, you did what you had to do, especially that, you know, it's good for international media. Now let us do the serious job. I think the country that represents seriously that is Lebanon also. Lebanese women are strongly uh, presented in public life, but they are still excluded from the establishment and political life and Diana is going to tell us more about it and to tell us also about the misogyny uh, among politicians and in the media I mean we've here recently comments that uh, you know uh, uh, upset all of us, such as, you know, a minister saying that we should cook uh, during the weekend or we should, yeah. So I think Diana is the is the, here to lead us and to talk about how women in Lebanon are very present in public life, but they are still excluded from the establishment and the political life. Thank you so much, Dalia. I'm so happy to be with you here uh, today. Uh, as you just said, uh, the world was impressed when uh, the 2019 uh, protests took place in, in the streets and everybody was impressed with how Lebanese women were so much active in the streets, protesting, organizing, uh, chanting slogans, uh, facing the security. So the representation of women in the streets and the high tone of demands and the, the strong uh, positioning of them in the streets really reflect, reflect the vitality of Lebanese women in general. Unfortunately, this presence, the liberal uh, side of Lebanese women presentation is not reflected on the political spectrum. Lebanon ranks very low when it comes to gender gap uh, uh, discrimination against women. We don't have a real political presentation within the uh, legislators, within the ministers, etc. But because of 2019 protests, uh, the politicians started uh, having, uh, wanting to prove, well, we want to have women presentations, although it's just a uh, plastic one, not serious presentation. But they are now putting on the table that we should have women presented in new governments and, and new elections. This is not to solve the problem, of course, but there is a recognition that what we have seen in 2019 should be reflected on the political side. Now, when, we, when it comes to laws, when it comes to social norms, we find a huge discrimination, in particular when we talk about personal status law. Why? Because Lebanon is, is, is based on sectarian uh, sects, the political system is a sectarian political system. 
mainly when it comes to status laws. In Lebanon, we have 15 personal status laws that, in general, all of these laws discriminates against women in custody, marriage, uh, divorce, uh, early marriage, of course, uh, nationality, women, Lebanese women cannot give nationality. So the real struggle that Lebanese women are going through nowadays is to try to uh, change these laws and have more modern and uh, uh, civic laws that equalizes between men and women and between women themselves because these laws discriminate even between women from let's say the Sunni sect and women from uh, the Shia or Muslim and Christian women. So in a nutshell, these laws are the core uh, discrimination against, Le uh, against women in Lebanon combined with misogyny with with uh, with norms with with perceptions that are inherited from long uh, from back ages where it discriminates against women and in, in, in pay and in, in, in media and uh, and so all all sorts of social and political uh, aspects of life you've just mentioned uh, how women are being portrayed in political life and in media you know in lebanon we have a, a bit of vital media presentation Again, yes, Lebanon has a more liberal approach, uh, more uh, a vibrant uh, media landscape, more freedoms. We have active life in Lebanon. But again, uh, within this positive side of it, we have so many negativities. Part of it is how women are being uh, harassed or addressed or uh, treated with a misogyny approach. Uh, you've just mentioned, uh, Dalia, the example of a politician we have on a daily basis sometimes, on a weekly basis sometimes, politicians and media uh, uh, presenters or public speakers addressing women in such a discriminatory and insulting way. Uh, the latest incident was when a sexologist uh, wanted to go, was invited on, on screens to, dis to talk about uh, sexual life, etc. She was mocked, she was in, on a huge scale whether on, on the television itself, on media landscape, or on social media. So we have a daily struggle when it comes to women issues. The perception is still distorted, and this is something we need to address by laws and by uh, social education. Again, but to be, uh, uh, to be positive in a way, I'm very much impressed by the feminist movement, the movement we have in Lebanon. People like Maya, uh, who is present with us today, went to the streets, protested, chanted, faced the uh, security uh, uh, people, also are trying to group themselves and having their voices heard. And this is having an effect. I like one of the examples that when you, when you use social media, when you use uh, public sphere, to try and campaign for a, for a real cause, sometimes it really brings a result. Uh, in the first days or weeks of the pandemic, when there was a lockdown and the government uh, officials uh, tried to uh, subsidize some products for, uh, uh, to help the people face the pandemic, they excluded sanitary uh, pads for women, but they added the razors of men. And that created a huge backlash led mainly by young feminists uh, and by young men and women who believe, uh, um, e believe in equal rights for society. And this tiny example, and of course, they, the, the governments acknowledge that. It's true that later on they, did not, they tried to manipulate it, but the embarrassment it caused for politicians that they, they did not recognize this such, uh, this is very important uh, part of every woman's life in Lebanon, uh, brought them really uh, shame and backlash from the community. I'm giving this example to say that we have an active uh, uh, civil society and feminist movement in Lebanon and feminist groups and human rights groups. Uh, they are all trying to, to form uh, a strong uh, public opinion that is trying to counter and to attack uh, all the discriminations that are taking place. It's not an easy path. It's a long uh, and sometimes very hard uh, path that we're going through. But I believe in the strong new 
uh, uh, feminists and uh, activists that are presented in Lebanon. And uh, the road is, is, I mean, it's our right. And we, I think we will reach a day where we can see uh, Lebanese women not just presented in a media landscape, but also in reality, in law, in, in political atmosphere. Uh, and this is why I have a be I believe in Lebanese uh, women uh, and their ability to counter all the uh, injustices that we are facing. So this is in a nutshell. Uh, the path is still long, but I think uh, that the slogan that was once carried, نحن لها, and I think the Lebanese women are really up to the challenge. Thank you. Uh, am I the only one not hearing Dalia? Sorry, I I forgot to unmute. Uh, I was saying thank you, Diana, for that. And I definitely agree, you know, there is uh, such uh, misogynistic uh, values that are so present, it will, uh, you know, we will need decades. For instance, uh, in Algeria, they introduced the laws of quota, which is a good start, but not enough. And then when the legislative election came, we were shocked, and I was shocked as an Algerian citizen and a woman, to see that the women represented in the list of some uh, parties, they didn't have a face. They put a flower instead of the face of the candidate. And, you know, on social media, many people said, yes, that's, that's okay because it's our culture. We shouldn't show the faces of our women. And so this leads me to the question of violence, be it symbolic violence against women or physical violence. And I think physical violence has been, you know, domestic violence has been exploding in uh, throughout the world, of course, but also especially in, uh, uh, to, to, to paraphrase uh, Valentin Mugaddam, the, the, the belt of patriarchy that the MENA region represent. And in Algeria, for instance, uh, we had a, a phenomena that is uh, starting or becoming a public health issue that is feminicides, uh, femicides, le feminicide, femicides, violence against women, women being murdered by their uh, their male counterparts, be, be them their kids, sometimes their father, uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, I wrote recently a piece uh, called Algeria War Against Women, in which I try, you know, to, uh, to to, to, to analyze this uh, phenomena. I'll, I'll start with uh, Maya. Maya, can you tell us more about the rise of, of violence against uh, women uh, uh, during the COVID pandemic that has actually exasperated uh, the phenomena? It did exist before, but I believe that the COVID-19 has aggravated uh, this uh, problem. Sure. Um, it was called by the UN Secretary General the shadow pandemic, and it really is a shadow pandemic. It has always been there, um, as you were saying. It increased, um, if I'm not mistaken, ninefold in Tunisia and in Lebanon, 100% at a minimum, and we're just talking about official reports by the internal security forces. Um, in France, you, you, we've seen how, how, how the state, um, coalesced with pharmacies, uh, because the, the, the pharmacies were the only, the only, um, marketplaces that were open just to see how they can support women because they've seen this coming and, and they, they're prepared. In Germany, the first thing they did was to dedicate hotels. Um, and turn them into shelters because they know that women, uh, just like in wars, in pandemics, they're also uh, the first to pay the brunt of disasters and catastrophes because the, because I I think when you're in an egalitarian society and when there's no discrimination, the pandemic by itself definitely when it increases psychological, emotional, economic pressure, but will not necessarily increase violence against women. Whereas when, when you have non-egalitarian societies, pandemics, wars, conflicts will increase pressure and will deepen uh, existing inequalities and injustices. And we look at care work sector, we've seen how women have raised their voices saying, we're just fed up of being teachers, nurses, 
uh, cooks, chefs, uh, drivers, cleaners, and workers as well. Um, so, so everything is exacerbated by uh, by disasters. And when we're talking about the pandemic, we're basically also talking about lockdowns and um, restrictions of movements. So, because women are very much uh, oppressed and violated within the private sphere, where most of the patriarchal control takes place imagine yourself in a lockdown in that private sphere with angry men uh, even angrier and under more pressure than before even though you're doing the whole job but anyway uh, in that private sphere with no uh, recourse for the uh, to the outside world whatsoever so this is partly why we've seen an increase in, in domestic violence. We've seen um, uh, even some feminists voicing the concerns of going back to traditional roles. So just like in the Arab Spring revolutions, once we are at home, we go back to uh, fulfilling expectations, traditional expectations from us. The pandemic has sort of done the same. And it hits me now this parallel between between these events and, and, and the pandemic, of course, um, even though some women would usually, you know, do the housework alongside their male partners at home, uh, they've just seen themselves so quickly going back to their traditional uh, roles without even thinking it twice. But then a year later saying, hey, we just got enough of that and re-questioning why it was so easy for them to be drawn back again uh, to what society and norms expect of them. And 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 I and I think violence against women is is the core feminist issue, really, because when we talk about um, participation, representation, when we talk about uh, um, political, being active in the political life, what really um, burdens women and, and, and what uh, prevents them from participating is actually that violence and it's deliberate. I'm going to be violent with you if you want to just uh, break out of my control. And it's a way of deterring women basically from going there, owning the world, and sharing it with, with men and with everybody else. So I think it is a, also somehow deliberate. And, and, and whenever women want to just step out of those boxes, they're, they're hit back again. And, and men, violence men, they, they know that too well. Um, and, and they know how to, how, how they, they're, some of them obviously are experts. In, in keeping women under their their control, um, and obviously in pandemics when they're under an extreme load of pressure. Thank you, thank you, Maya, for that. I definitely agree with you, and I think this is, uh, you know, there are laws in the Arab world. For instance, is, uh, if I come back to uh, uh, to Algeria, there are a lot of laws and legal and institutional reforms that have been done, you know, to improve uh, and to promote and to protect women's uh, rights. But unfortunately, there is also a problem of mentality. Uh, for instance, in Algeria, corporal punishment of women by their husband or male relative is widespread and accepted by society. I remember, uh, you know, as you know, it's accepted as a form of, of uh, uh, I would say, a, a method of discipline. There was this uh, video, an AG plus, uh, an AG plus video, a poll that was made a few years ago, maybe two or three, in which that stated that 60% of Algerian women accepted to be disciplined by their male uh, counterpart. And this is in itself, uh, this is a way you can see how actually patriarchy is embedded within our you know uh, is internalized by women in the, in the region and this is a big uh, uh, problem and you know there is also the problem of stigmatization and hostility from society but also from police enforcement towards women how women how many women entered a police station to you know to file a complaint and they were you know just um, uh, convinced by the police officer not to do so uh, so anyone want to jump uh, in or uh, yes Diana. Yeah, yes, because because of my work uh, at Daraj Media, where we get stories from all over the Arab countries, the level of violence against women and the harsh and the extreme uh, violent attacks against women is 
to me is unprecedented. We are dealing with cases where the society or the family are trying to cover up. Yes, it has been there all the time, but because of the pandemic, because of the economical and political situation, nobody is talking about it. Unfortunately, whenever you are in a crisis or in a war, they consider that women's rights is, is a luxury. Don't t t talk about women's rights. We have to address violence. We have to address war. We have to address uh, economical situation. So as Maya said, as the re international report said, it's a shadow pandemic. The level of violence have become really, really scary that nobody is really giving a shit. I'm sorry for, excuse my word, but this is really uh, uh, very alarming. The, the dealing, addressing the violence that is amounting against women all over the Arab world. It's not only Lebanon, it's not, the cases are, are uh, her, 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 full of horror. When you hear what happened in Egypt, in Jordan, in Palestine, and it's uh, all covered. So to me, this is really something very, very substantial. And it's part of, we cannot, we cannot prioritize. It's all priority. We cannot say, let's stop war first. No, we have to address all of them together. And it has to have a strategy, how to address violence against women as we are dealing with the pandemic, as we are dealing with economical crisis and wars. It's all the same level of intensity. Intisar, please. Yeah, I wanted to, to chip in that, uh, you know, it's been an absolute uh, nightmare scenario in terms of increasing the, 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 the pressure and the possibilities for violence against women, especially in the private sphere during uh, the confinement, the, the lockdown. And, uh, you know, in Tunisia, we saw that the, the, the women's ministry um, received five times to nine times as many calls on its number for uh, support for victims of domestic violence. So, you know, in between just two months, they received 7,000 uh, calls. Uh, and so this really was a, a, a nightmare for women who were confined to the same space as their aggressor. And, you know, there are also, I mean, something I want to raise is that, uh, you know, the role of uh, women's organizations and also implementing the law, because something we notice is that even when the laws are there, like in Tunisia, we have uh, the law against uh, violence against women, uh, the actual implementation is very weak. And so, you know, you have all these uh, wonderful legal provisions that, for example, you need a specialized unit in every police uh, station that is uh, specializing in uh, violence against women. But when you go down to the ground, um, you really see that these people are not trained, these specialized units don't exist, and women are actually having to bear the brunt of this by themselves. They have absolutely no support when it comes to uh, reporting these cases. And their only form of support is their families where that support actually exists because they don't always have that. And so uh, really it's, we need to think about also mechanisms to make it easier for women to support, uh, to report. So uh, some of the women's organizations were calling for allowing victims of abuse to, um, to report directly to the public prosecutor's office uh, remotely. So using online methods, using phone, because it's difficult for victims to travel, you know, in these situations. And so it, it really highlights that legal instruments are not enough. Obviously, the, the struggle for changing the laws is one thing, but it doesn't end there. There is also a huge struggle to actually, as uh, Diana was mentioning, the social norms around it, the actual practices um, in society and in state institutions, there is a long way to go in terms of actually making sure these laws are implemented. And so it is a, you know, more work and vigilance uh, for all groups, all human rights organizations, because domestic violence is a human rights issue. It's not just a women's issue uh, to work actually to monitor how these laws are being implemented and to push for these institutions, especially the police force, uh, to change their behavior. Thank you, Antisar. Yasmin, do you want to jump in? Yes, sure. Um, I just wanted to add, uh, speaking about violence, um, what concerns us the most is a future with no state, a future with, um, you know, a militia that only speaks one language, which is the language of violence. I mean, in this conflict so far, uh, the violent action of the Houthis militia um, has destroyed the life of women. Uh, 
you know, it's like Houthi follows the example of the Islamic Republic of Iran, uh, such as, and, and, and they, uh, you know, implement many methods against women, such as uh, banning them from wearing colorful abayas, taking off their hijabs, not even hijab, even wearing belts. In Sana'a, many women and girls have lost their jobs due to the brutal decision made by Houthis prohibiting them from working in restaurants or in any public spaces uh, in which men and women are mixed. According to Houthis, women belong at home. There are also women who are currently in prison for criticizing gender discrimination laws imposed by Houthis and protesting against Houthi leaders for inciting violence against women in mosques during Friday uh, prayers. So, and imagine uh, we lack protection programs as well. So there is no shelters for women. Uh, if women are able to, to, if women are released from the prisons of the Houthis and they want to go to Marib or they want to go to Aden, uh, there is no shel shelters for them. And if there is shelter, then there are certain conditions that they should not be uh, in prison before. So we are dealing as, you know, like women-led organizations are uh, actually playing the role of the international communities and the government and um, handling all these uh, um, uh, big scale projects, re relocation of women, uh, maybe setting women to find a safe uh, place, giving orientation to women on how to deal with emergency or uh, threats. Uh, so yeah, so, and, and the, the list is very long. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. Uh, I think we reached the time when we should answer the Q&A of some of our participants here. I'm going to start with Maz. Uh, I'm just saying his, uh, avoiding to say his name just in case, but uh, he said, um, I would die to have representatives like these four women. Uh, and I am a man. Aren't we primarily deprived of proper representation? And if yes, is female emancipation part of our overall struggle? So who wants to jump in? And please notice the compliment he would die to have representation like uh, yeah. this one. Uh, no, don't, don't die for anything, I guess uh and and thank you for for your question i saw also the second question if i may uh yes definitely I think, please i think yeah i just appreciate the approach uh and this is something we've uh, we've always struggled with usually men uh friends that we have are are feeling lost and confused because as women you see we've evolved and progressed so much um we 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 had to unfortunately uh and we had to change we had to cope we had to um we had to go really like miles uh and miles long trips men on on the other hand a lot of them um have not changed enough and have found themselves stuck in a moment in history where they are seeing women around them progressing and and changing and and exploring new uh, horizons um and also uh, altering old mentalities whereas they haven't yet done this sort of exercise and i think men need to be speaking together more often about this and they need to have their spaces to speak together more often about this because if at this moment in history, they're included in female uh, spaces, they will automatically, they, they tend to take over the conversation because of this whole um, heritage that they have when it comes to uh, taking over the space uh, and and the, the sort of confidence that, that they have and, and also because of safety concerns, which a lot of women have. So I think what, what, what men can do is to start thinking about what role do they see for themselves in these constantly changing times and and contexts and and what will they do to actually be coping with uh, with with those changes and and definitely in my opinion men can be allies and uh, they uh, they can uh, surely support women's movement they don't have to call themselves feminists they don't have to say that um uh, that 
you know, nothing will ever be done without them and, and thinking that, you know, they're the center of the world. I think it's okay to step aside for a little bit, for a little while, reflect, see what roles they, they, they want each and every one of them for themselves and how to support uh, the, the feminist movement. So definitely, yes, we're deprived of, of proper representation. Um, we, we lack democratic representation overall, but just imagine that women, even uh, when, uh, when mostly male figures were represented, they've always been underrepresented. So we, we live this misrepresentation doubly. First, because we're not represented by the political parties and groups that we wish to be represented by and second because as women we're also not represented at, at all so we share that um, that feeling of course but we share it uh, doubly anyone else or should i switch to yeah, another question uh, Tisar, do you want I, to jump I, in yes Please. sure I, I really appreciated the question as well and i think it's it's incredibly important um, and I think it is it is important for men to take responsibility. You know, I think, uh, um, you know, one of the debates that happened in Tunisia around, you know, sexual harassment and Me Too is that there is a societal responsibility. You know, this is uh, not just something for women to, to, to carry and to complain about, but it's actually a societal problem. Um, and I think that also men are losing out from a patriarchal culture because patriarchal culture limits men to particular roles as well and restricts their expression. And so actually, you know, everybody loses out. It's not just women. Uh, men also lose out on having partners who are, you know, able to participate with them fully, to be alongside them in different uh, contexts. Uh, and so I think the first thing is for men also to listen to women, to, to, to hear about their experiences. Uh, you know, uh, similar, it's a, it's a form of injustice, just like any other form of injustice. Uh, and so if, you know, if you were seeing a, a, a group of people who are facing a, a major injustice, it is our responsibility to actually listen to their experiences. And it's even more shocking when it's half of society, obviously, not just a minority. And so I think a, a good starting point is to, you know, um, talk to those women around you and actually listen to their experiences because often that space is not available and that is a good starting point i think for um you know thinking about what men and women can do together um and i'm uh, you know i was impressed uh, with some experiences i had in in uh, europe with african feminists uh, that they are very actually very inclusive of the men in their societies and i think that's very important men shouldn't understand feminism as being anti-male uh, it's actually uh, it's an inclusive uh you know, approach. Uh, and men can also play just as an important role in that as women. If I may add, uh, Dalia, of course, uh, what have been said by Intisara and Maya, I fully agree. Uh, but patriarchal structure is, is not limited to men. And this is something we really need to address. Sometimes the defenders of the patriarchal system are some women and uh, some wicked groups. I remember when we started discussing civil marriage in Lebanon, we found some uh, radical groups are organizing women partners from their group, refusing to have uh, civil marriage in Lebanon from a so-called women perspective. So they are trying to put women for, uh, facing women uh, who are refusing having civil marriage or civil codes in Lebanon. So it's really a, a mentality. Uh, unfortunately, some women uh, are being taught that this is their positioning in the society. So you are facing a mentality. It's true, it's adopted by majority of men, but don't undermine the role sometimes of a mother or a sister or a mother-in-law or uh, the, the family structure that enhances this mentality and discriminates double against certain women. It's really hard when I see a woman standing against herself. So really we have to be very, very careful when we are addressing this mentality. It's a structure that is taking everybody in on its way. So this is something I just wanted to point out. Yes, definitely. I agree with you. And sometimes, you know, to say it bluntly and to be provocative, I would say we are our worst enemy sometimes because we just internalize this mentality and this patriarchy and this misogyny. So we reach the point of, some women reach the point to find it 
normal between between quotes and um so katya asks uh, can can men ever be included in this conversation would we ever have a mature man or will we we'll be looking at hidden agendas and mask and katya continues with another question and i think this one is for yasmin she say, she says i saw houthi fighters wearing women dresses how did you feel looking at houthi cross dressing any female thoughts on this please um well i'm I, i've read the the question and i'm not really sure if it was um a video i seen for um young men wearing uh, dressing like women uh to be able to uh, sneak into some areas where the government uh, under the government uh, uh control areas i think it was to marib so oh, um it's uh it's a uh, healthy behavior it's not uh, it's not um, we're not it's surprised more of anyway strategy, i would say yes. it's a strategy yes. we we've seen yes. fighters of the armed islamic group in algeria in the 90s also wearing you know uh, women clothes but it was a war strategy to sneak out to other uh, state controlled area yeah but just to add one thing because uh you know in yemen they they usually even the checkpoints uh they they uh, respect the woman they don't really um investigate very much and ask them to for example to sometimes not all the time to remove their hijab or their veil but that's why they're trying to take advantages of that okay so we have 5 minutes left and i am going to be very provocative again I read a few months ago in Le Monde uh, a report that was basically, you know, uh, assessing gender equality in the world, and it was saying about uh, pretty uh, evolved, I would say, countries such as, you know, Sweden and Denmark. That even in this country, we need to wait fifty uh, more years to have a perfect, you know, very balanced gender equality. So, yes, I mean, Diana, Maya, Intisar, in a few minutes first question how much would you give the mina region how much time what do you think of they said 50 years for denmark what it is about us and second question are you um uh, positive or uh, you know are you optimistic or uh, pessimistic regarding uh, the, the 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 role of women in society and gender equality in our uh, mina region I would say, um, uh, Maya, start as we started with you, then Intisar, Yasmin, and Diana. Please go ahead. Yes, um, actually, you asked something that's been covered by a study, and it says that 150 years are needed for the men region to close the gender gap. I'm sorry to like close on this very bright note. <laughs> so not even like the generation of any of you's children. So I um, I think that if we still follow the space, this is what what's uh, what's uh, awaiting us, unfortunately. Uh, but as feminists, I believe we're going to be able to break. Uh, this uh, statu quo, and I'm um, and I'm forced to be hopeful, to be honest, because uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, social political changes. Maybe maybe it will slow down for a while in uh, in certain countries, in certain contexts. There are a lot of challenges, a lot of oppression. Um, I mean, uh, hearing uh, Yasmin and 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 really about and and. Countries and conflicts, I think, and Lebanon, maybe we have social unrest, uh, but not necessarily yet to the level of, uh, of armed conflicts. But if we look at Syria, if you look at uh, Yemen, um, it's, uh, it's not promising at all. And it's the, uh, probably the fall down of the nation state we've dreamed about, where we have the secular nation state that will come and protect our rights. This is in question now, and it's definitely going to affect us as, uh, as women. And, um, and so, yes, I think that there's going to be a lot of challenges ahead, even in Sudan, where they've uh, announced themselves as a secular uh, state. I think they, 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 they still kept the personal status codes as is. They haven't really changed it uh, as women expected. So, so these are signs that things are moving some in some places, but not necessarily in the ways that we've, we'd wished for them to move. Uh, but they, they will move. They are moving. And I, I think that, uh, with, with a, with a little bit of patience and hope really in this young generation that we're all celebrating here and the vibrant, 
uh, which Diana used to describe the feminist movement. I think this is where we're going to be in, investing in the next uh, few years, and and I think miracles will just happen. We can't hear you, Dalia. I said thank you, Maya. I think we have one optimistic here. Next, Intisar. Yeah, so I I uh, want to join my uh, my voice to Maya's. I, I'm very optimistic as a as a, a way of being generally. I think that's the only way to be in uh, very difficult circumstances that I think our region is facing. Uh, but something that uh, gives me hope is also looking back at history. So you know, I was reading about um, women's struggles in the past and about um, you know even in the French Revolution. I was very surprised to see that. Uh, you know, when women uh, participated in the French Revolution and they uh, participated in the protest that toppled the monarchy, um, and then after that, you know, when they asked for equal rights, they were completely left out of the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen uh, in 1789, and only men counted as citizens. And so you mentioned Algeria also, um, and I think that, um, you know, history shows us that, um, you know, the struggle has to continue, and I think that mobilization has actually grown and it's broadened, you know, the examples that we see here, Lebanon, uh, Yemen, others, you see, uh, you know, uh, older generations continuing their struggle, younger generations joining the struggle as well, and broadening um, their demands and using new tools as well. Uh, so using social media, so we have the public sphere that's bringing together women who are mixing from different backgrounds, different classes, different regions, and uh, discovering a common voice and and common grievances and differences, which is also fine. And uh, at the same time, you have online tools that are being used uh, by diaspora, by uh, uh, in social media, and that's engaging uh, a lot more of a wide audience, including men, which I think is very positive. Uh, so we saw a lot of solidarity, um, you know, when it came to sexual harassment, for example, campaigns in Egypt and Tunisia. And so I think that you know the mobilization is broadening, and I think that's very uh, positive. Um, and uh, women's voices are louder, and I think they will continue so, to, to get. So, two optimistic people. Um, what do you think, Yasamin and Diana, in in a in few seconds? Um, from my side, I'm very optimistic. I'm very impressed and happy and satisfied with the feminist movement and the women's struggle. Um, I think the networks that have been created and the, uh, the solidarity among the Yemeni women is absolutely uh, extra, uh, extraordinary. And uh, we will continue definitely uh, claiming spaces. Uh, we're not waiting for them to invite us. I love the last sentence, Diana. Uh, I'm not counting either days or years. It's an inevitable path. We're taking it. It's a survival thing. Uh, we do it or we die. So yes, the, the battle is on and we will not look for timeline. This is what we have to do. Well, thank you for this. I think with, with women like you, we will definitely do it before 150 years. Thank you again for being here. It was really good. It was amazing. Thank you again. I hope you uh, there, you enjoyed it as much as we did. Thank you, Diana. Thank you, Maya. Thank you, Intisar. Thank you, Yasemin. And it was really a great pleasure for Carnegie Middle East Center to host you today. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye.